Good morning, Madam Civil Party. May we know your name? Civil Party. Good morning, Mr. President. My name is Supani Bay. President, how old are you? Answer. I am 67 years old. Question. Where were you born? Answer. I was born in Kampong Chang province. Question. Where is your current address? Answer. I live in San Jose in California, America. Question. What are the names of your parents? Answer. My father is Uy Nam and my mother is Sing Sien. Question. Are you married? If so, what is his name and how many children do you have? Answer. Um, I am married. His name is Saren Bay. And we have three children, one son and two daughters. Thank you. As a civil party before this court, you are given an opportunity to make a statement of our sufferings inflicted upon you materially, emotionally, and physically, which are the direct result of the crimes, and which led you to become a civil party in this case. The crimes that have been charged against the two accused, that is Nun Chi and Kiu Sampon, and which took place during the Democratic Cambodia regime from the 17th April 1975 to the 6th of January 1979. You will first be questioned by your civil party lawyer and you will then have the opportunity to make your statement on sufferings and impact. The floor is now given to the assigned lawyer for civil party to put the questions to this civil party. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. If I may make a brief introduction before I begin my questions. Your Honor, Mrs. Safani Bay is a direct victim of the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh. She submitted her victim information to the court. That's document number D22-3850. Her victim information form was written in both Khmer and English, and that's available at ERN 00571050 through 75. The French ERN is 00846057 through 72. The Khmer translation is at 0086525. 19 through 26 and the English translation is 0086-7203 through 11. She was admitted by OCIJ as a victim of the force transfer from Phnom Penh. Her testimony today will detail her experience under the Khmer Rouge regime and the resulting impact of these traumatic events. We will hear that as a mother alone with her children on the day of the evacuation, 
Mrs. Bay was forced to flee her home with her six-month-old baby and her two small children, with only one small pack of clothes, milk, and water to sustain them. Her testimony today will describe the harm she and her children endured during the march out of Phnom Penh and the devastating loss of all three children as a result of the regime. Mrs. Bay left Cambodia in 1983, where she was reunited with her husband. She will explain that even though she left Cambodia and now resides in the US, her suffering continues to this day. At present, she's a mental health counselor at the Gardner Mental Health Center in San Jose, California. This is a clinic that was created as a special program to assist victims of the Khmer Rouge regime in that county and have been identified as having overwhelming mental health problems related to trauma. Mrs. Bay will explain that her symptoms are not unique. She sees the same symptoms amongst her clients and the community around her. Mrs. Bay will explain that not only did the war tear apart her community, it left her and her husband childless, without an extended family, and with a feeling of hopelessness and isolation that endures to this day. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to pose some questions to the civil party re regarding her relevant experience under the Khmer Rouge, if I may. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Bay. Before we begin talking about your experiences under the Khmer Rouge, will you first describe to the court what your life was like before April 1975? Good morning, counsel, and good morning, Mr. President and journalists. Today, I am grateful that I could travel from the United States to appear before this court and to have the opportunity to make my statement of sufferings regarding what we suffered under the Khmer Rouge regime from 1975 to late 1978. Before the 17th April 1975, I was living in Phnom Penh. I was a teacher and my husband at the time was the lieutenant colonel and was the youngest brother of Samtio Kane the first wife of the Marshal Lunol. I had three children. The eldest son was Sapanavung Bay, Alice Paul, and my daughter's name was Botum Kunti Bay, Alice Pin, and my two month baby at the time was Lila Day, Alice Pom. I was living with my husband and my families and in late 1974, my husband was assigned by Lunol government to study in Fort Benning in Columbus in Georgia for the senior official military role. And I was living in my, with my three children in Phnom Penh at the time. And can you tell the court what happened to you on April 17th, 1975? On the 17th April 1975, Khmer Rouge soldiers entered Phnom Penh. They were walking everywhere along the streets. They were dressing in black uniformed, and every one of them, male and female, were armed. They had stunned facial expression. And those Khmer soldiers began firing shots into the air and chased the people to immediately leave their houses 
and Phnom Penh. I was terrified. I could not imagine that uh, that they would do do that. I carried my youngest child and together with my two other children I could not manage to carry any much belonging. So I only got a clothes for each of my child and some milk and milk bottles and I placed them all in a carry bag that I used to use it for going to school and I had to leave urgently as we were repeatedly chased and warned by the Khmer Rouge soldiers and they said that the Americans would drop the bomb very soon and that we would only leave for three days. I had to leave. If not, and if the Khmer Rouge soldiers enter my house, I would be killed or I could not imagine what would happen because I had photos of my husband in the military uniform displayed in the house as well as the photos of my related uh, family member of a Marshal Lundnold. So together with my three children and a bag filled uh, with clothes, I went to my elder sister-in-law's house whose husband was the Vice Minister of the General Mobilization named Wan Sarand. But the Khmer Rouge stopped me from proceeding forward. For that reason, I had to leave where I was pointed through. I did not know where I should head through. Everybody was confused. So I just kept going along with the rest, along the side streets, reaching the main street and the road was fully crowded. Each step took a long time to move forward and I was on the main road near Chamkamon and we were heading in the directions uh, instructed by the Khmer Rouge so we reached Kabat North and then Chiba Ompo and along the road as I observed on the day the scene was pitiful. I saw dead bodies the bodies of the lunar soldiers, the bodies of elder people, the body of children and the pregnant women. And another scene that I witnessed was that of the disabled people and those people who still hated oxygen in their nostril. And if you can recall, that was the hot season, the hot month in Cambodia. And we had to travel under the heat of the sun. We kept moving very slowly under the heat of the sun, together with my three children. I held on very tight to my children as I was afraid uh, I might uh, lose them. So we walk crossing Kabat Nald, crossing through Chabao Ompo, and then we was we were heading toward the Trausla. The journey took us several days before we could leave the Phnom Penh. We had to stop and rest it at empty houses belongs to uh, Chinese families and we would just stay at any empty houses as the rest of the travelers did. So we just kept uh, going and uh, one time we reached an area where there were a lot of uh, mango trees 
It was raining that day and I had uh, nothing to uh, protect my children. So we took a refuge under a mango tree. We were all soaked. I had my young baby close to my chest and I covered the baby with my body and in the morning we were chased to go further by the Khmer Rouge soldiers and from that day my young baby that is my daughter became sick that was because of the impact of being soaked under the rain and because of the extreme heat she got fever and my two other children also got fever and myself also got fever but we had to force ourselves to move as instructed by the Khmer rules and we did not know we did not have any destination in mind later on we reached Traosla and my children situation became worse so I decided to stay in that Trai Sla village. I t we went to take refuge under the house of the best people. Those best people had a pity on us because they saw I had uh, young children so they gave us uh, some food but the Khmer soldiers reprimanded the bad people and instructed them to stop giving food to us and we were chased to move to stay far away from the bad people because of my uh, distinct social class as I was treated as the new person, the 17 April person, and the villagers were considered the best people. So the Khmer soldiers chased me away, chased us away to the end of the, to the outskirts of the village and tried to build our shade by ourselves. My youngest baby was becoming even seriously sick. But because the Khmer soldiers threatened us, I had to go into the forest and to pick the palm tree leaves with my two elder children. And it was still pretty small at the time. And then I borrowed a knife and cut some tree branches and then I dug the crown and erect the those palm tree leaves uh, as our shelter but I could not stay there for long as my daughter became seriously sick with me I had a diamond ring which was a gift from my elder sister-in-law when I got married. So I exchanged that diamond ring for some medicines uh, with the best people. Initially, I exchanged for 25 cans of uh, rice. And then I exchanged the rice with aspirin. I got a 10 tablets of aspirin and other medicine for the treatment of my children and myself. But uh, the medicine could not improve the condition of my children, especially my young daughter. She got dysentery, she could not eat anything and she would throw, throw up when she ate anything. So I went around looking for anyone who had the medical experience to help my children. 
One villager then advised me to walk about four or five kilometers from the village and that I would find a military hospital. So I went along by carrying uh, my daughter and uh, with uh, the other two children. I saw a male soldier and I was told that he was the medic. I begged that military medic, asking him to save my children. I told them that my children got fever and dysentery and would not take anything. The medic asked me to bring along my children and have a, a, a few beds and I was asked to put my young baby on the bed. Then he came back with some kind of medicine and the, he injected my baby on the skin, on, on top of the skull. I did not dare ask what it was. Upon the time he took away the needle, my youngest child got seizure and passed away. I cried. That was the first time that I witnessed such a tragedy in my life. I hugged my baby and we all cried. In the afternoon, I carried uh, my dead, the dead body of my youngest daughter to bury in the forest nearby. I carried the dead body to the forest nearby and then I buried her myself. There were only two people help me dig uh, the pit and I put my dead, uh, the dead body in the pit and I put a a wooden post on the grave so that I could recognize uh, it later on. At that time I was very confused. I was in the state of uh, confusion. I could not do anything. I became very forgetful and since then uh, the Khmer Rouge soldier made me to work extremely hard uh, from morning till night. I had to plant corn. My two other kids uh, stay at home. Nobody took care of them. They stayed at home alone and I had to go to the corn field uh, to work. And upon my return uh, at home, uh, I did not see my two kids. I was very, very shocked. I had to try to look for my uh, kids. And then uh, a few minutes later, uh, they came back home. I was happy they carried with them uh, two small branch of uh, trees. And then my younger sister told uh, me that uh, she used this uh, small uh, branch uh, of uh, tree uh, to dig something uh, for uh, some, to look for something for it and they uh, told me every day about what they had to do and I was uh, very shocked uh, upon hearing what they had to do uh, during the daytime so I decided to leave uh, the place I decided I attempted to leave uh, the place uh, twice but I uh, could not do it because I was eventually arrested by the Khmer Rouge uh, soldier and upon arresting me they, the Khmer Rouge warned me uh, not to attempt to leave uh, the place I had to uh, stay on and then on the third attempt I could uh, leave uh, the place I had to take a small uh, boat over there crossing the uh, river and then I uh, went to another village at that time uh, I uh, got to that village and then uh, there was a truck taking the uh, Chinese back to Phnom Penh in order to plant vegetable and then I uh, begged them to get on the truck by themselves and then they asked me I was not Chinese why uh, did I get on the truck I told I uh, begged them uh, to uh, kindly give me the lift uh, to Phnom Penh so 
at that time when we got to uh, Phnom Penh, the place where they uh, grow vegetable, they did not uh, took the they do not ask the people to leave the truck. They continue uh, to take uh, us uh, to Tuol Line Pagoda near Kampung Kantut. Over there, there was a military base. It was uh, the battalion, a battalion, and there were many Khmeru soldiers. They were wearing black uniform and they were fully armed uh, they came to take us uh, from the truck and then they brought us to uh, an empty house and people were packed in that house at that time it was completely dense with uh, people it was like a bunch of banana people were staying in such a dense and uh, a house and then The Khmer Rouge made the people uh, to clear the uh, bushes and forests in order to uh, clear the forest for uh, farming. We had to do it. Uh, it was a very uh, difficult uh, job. Uh, we got stung by insects uh, and uh, we had to work until we could clear the forest uh, for uh, farming. And then after we uh, had cleared the forest, they uh, made us to uh, plow the field. At that time, they did not use uh, buffaloes or any animals to plow the field. Uh, they uh, used uh, human labor to plow the field. And those who resist going or those who pretend to be lazy, they would uh, be bitten instantly. They... Uh, harshly uh, bit uh, them. I had to work over there. It was in that place that my uh, son, Paul Sovannawong, one day my son uh, asked to follow me uh, to work. He did not want to go to, uh, did, did not want to stay at home. Then the Khmer Rouge uh, soldier did not allow my son to follow me uh, to the uh, rice field. Two Khmer Rouge soldiers then um, took my son out and then one of the Khmer Rouge soldiers put a gun inside my son's mouth. My son was crying but he, his tear did not drop but he was crying very very hard. The Khmer Rouge uh, told my son and me that uh, my son was not a Cambodian son. He was an American son. He was an imperialist son. Look at him. Uh, he was crying but his uh, tear did not drop out. Um, then the Khmer Rouge soldier told me that uh, he did not, he would not kill my son, but he had to uh, threaten him so that he would not uh, follow uh, me uh, to work. Then one, the other soldier of the Khmer Rouge uh, pointed the guns at my back, uh, pushing me uh, to go to work. I begged uh, them uh, for mercy. I begged them not to kill my son. If they killed my son, they had better kill me. Uh, I told them at that time, and uh, he took a uh, uh, scarf in to tie my uh, son's uh, hand together. My son was screaming uh, very hard at that time, but of course his uh, tear did not come out. He put my son in a small pond. My son was still screaming. And as for my daughter, um, she did not want to follow me, but she uh, wanted to follow her brother. So I had no choice but to uh, go to work. So I had to continue walking. But while walking, I turned back to look, uh, f to look at my son, what would happen to my son. Then when I uh, look at uh, them, and then uh, my son and the daughter uh, decided to run after me and uh, they uh, when they got to me uh, he fell down he could not say anything he just fell down on my feet and my uh, daughter my son could not say anything because he had lost all of his energy and words and then they uh, my uh, then my daughter uh, told me everything and then I untie uh, my Sons, uh, then I saw uh, the 
the bleeding on the uh, hands i felt very very sorrowful at that time and since then my two uh, children uh, body got uh, swollen and then they got very sick and their situation only uh, got worse each day the Khmer Rouge did not give us food uh, to eat every day I only receive only only a cup of watery uh, cruel uh, for the uh, uh, for the adults as for kids uh, they were given only half of a cup of watery cruel I at that time had one watch with me, uh, a Seiko brand. I uh, had hidden it uh, in some somewhere uh, in somewhere along my west. I took this uh, rest watch uh, to exchange uh, for some medicine. Uh, from the villagers, I got some uh, vitamin uh, B on B1. I received only eight tablets of vitamin B1 in exchange for this rest watch. And upon getting these uh, pills, I administered uh, them to my uh, children. But the situation, the condition of my children did not get better because the body, their bodies were swollen all over. And then the Khmer Rouge uh, soldier sent me to another military base, uh, 320. Uh, this uh, base uh, was known as 320. At that place, uh, the Khmer Rouge soldier made me to work very hard. I had to carry earth um, every day uh, they wanted to build a dam over there i stayed there for three months then they uh, continued to send me to another new place which i did not know its whereabouts and then the Khmer Rouge soldier uh, took a biography of me i told them that i was a former teacher but the Khmer Rouge soldier did not believe in me and then they stared at me with a very stern impression they said that uh, i was not a teacher i was a tv commentator uh, during the lonol regime uh, from that day onward the Khmer Rouge uh, undertook surveillance on my activity day and night and then uh, they took me and my children as well as others uh, to be located somewhere in Tiso uh, mountain over there. We had to work extremely hard. Uh, we had to uh, break um, the stones uh, and we had to stay in a very miserable uh, hut. Uh, we had to work extremely hard breaking rocks. Uh, we work all the time. Whenever the Khmer Rouge uh, asked us to work, we had to work. There is no uh, working hour for us. It was in that place that my son got uh, even worse and I ran out of any medicine at all. I had no idea what to uh, do uh, with my uh, sick son and in addition the Khmer Rouge soldiers starved us they did not give us any food uh, to eat at all uh, when we stayed there for two days we had nothing to eat we only ate uh, the wild plant leaf uh, we boiled them and then ate the wild plant leaf and I also begged some people for some uh, rice uh, that I beg other people for uh, together with some uh, palm fruit that I pick uh, along the uh, way and then I, I prepare that for uh, the food at that time and then on that night when we were so starving we did not have anything to eat but uh, the uh, plant leaf I uh, cry very painfully I hug my two children i did not know actually while at that night uh, i uh, hug my son i did not know when my son passed away and the next morning when i got up i saw my son uh, he was motionless he 
his but the temperature got very cold and I did not know I tried to open uh, the eyes of my son I tried to feel uh, him on the nose uh, but then I realized that my son had already passed away it was a very miserable things in my life we had nothing to it I believe that we die because of starvation and in the afternoon I carry I carried the dead body of my son uh, myself uh, to bury nobody help us uh, only some people who took pity on our family they help us to dig uh, the pit uh, to carry to bury our son I uh, buried my uh, Sun to bury uh, somewhere near the foothill of uh, Chiso Mountain, and then I put a stone and I carve a stone myself. Just carve the name of my son Paul. I put it on uh, the grave of my son. And then when I came back home, my only son, my only daughter, rather at home, uh, she got sick and very very sick and at that time she uh, her condition was uh, very terrible and then I could not uh, do anything to help I did not have any medicine to administer anything and Eventually, my daughter, my only daughter, died. And my daughter, my last daughter who died, she was a very clever, a very clever daughter. She is only five at that time. But she continued to talk to me until, until uh, she died. She told me that, uh, Mommy, please uh, take me to the doctor. Please uh, give me some medicine. I wanted to live with you. I want to stay with you. I did not want to go away from you. And then just uh, minutes later, she told me that Mommy uh, Pin would not survive, would not live with you. When will our father come back from the United States? Why did he stay so long in the United States? You, Mommy, had to find father. And then she died immediately. Then when my last daughter died, I became almost insane. I could not do anything. This was the last time that I had nothing left for my life. I became almost insane. I did not talk to anybody. I cried myself. I wanted to die with my uh, children because I had nothing left. I had nothing left. My children were all dead. After that miserable period, I became almost insane myself, and some people even call me Nieng Bandacha, a sorrowful lady. This uh, was the tragedy in our family. It was the consequence of the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, they died because of the Khmer Rouge uh, soldier. And I would like to appeal to the court uh, to find justice. And I would like everyone in this court to understand my uh, sorrowful life. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to display a photograph on the screen. Uh, this is in the case file under document number E285.1.1. That's ERN 00910047. Mrs. Bay, do you recognize this photograph? Yes, this is this is the photo of my youngest daughter. Lee Lavaday alias Pom. I also uh, bring this uh, hard copy photo with me. This is the photo of my youngest daughter. Uh, she was injected on her head by the Khmer Rouge uh, medic and then she died instantly after uh, that. She was the first uh, daughter to die. And how did you know that the person that injected her head was Khmer Rouge? Yes, 
the president um, civil party please um, hold on until the microphone is activated response because the villager told me that uh, this was the hospital of the Khmer Rouge Thank you. And do you have any other photographs of your children to this day? No, I do not have any other photo. This is the only single uh, photo that I sent uh, to my husband in the United States just a week uh, prior to the uh, Khmer Rouge entering uh, Phnom Penh. That's why he only had this uh, photo uh, with him. And I do not have any other photos uh, of my other children. The Khmer Rouge uh, destroyed all of them. Thank you, Mrs. Bay. Now, at the end of the war, how many members of your family survived? When the Khmer Rouge regime was over, I had nothing left, completely nothing left. I had to try to look for my parents in Kampung Chnang, but they all disappeared. I saw no one. I saw empty uh, land and only palm trees. I asked the villager. The villager told me that the Khmer Rouge had exterminated my family. They had killed my father first. I had to look for my families on my husband's side, but again, they were all killed. They exterminated my family, uh, both on my side and my uh, f husband's side. I had nobody left. I, ho I had no relative left. I only had my husband who uh, resides in the United States. Thank you, Mrs. Bay. Now, I'd like to ask you a few questions now, if I may, about the impact of these traumatic experiences on your life. The President, uh, Council, please uh, be reminded that you have only four minutes uh, left, uh, including the uh, questions uh, you put and the response uh, from the Civil Party. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, can you describe to us uh, how your experience under the Khmer Rouge affected your health? After I uh, reunited uh, with my husband in 1983, uh, my husband was a handicapped uh, person and because of the uh, suffering I sustained from the Khmer Rouge uh, regime, I became mentally sick. I also had some uh, disease uh, with me as well. I always uh, had nightmare and uh, I, at night sometimes I had uh, uh, nightmare, I scream, I live in a traumatic life uh, because of this uh, tragedy during the Khmer Rouge regime to, until today uh, I still uh, have nightmare of the atrocity of the Khmer Rouge regime. At night I would uh, dream of the Khmer Rouge soldier uh, chasing me and trying to kill me. Your Honor, uh, since we have an extra one and a half hours today, would you mind if I take a few more minutes to question the civil party? The President, uh, your request is not uh, granted because um, she will have to respond to the uh, questions uh, as well, and I don't think that you have uh, used the uh, time effectively.
Can I ask another quick question? And I will ask uh, Mrs. Bay if she can answer the question very quickly. And Mrs. Bay, what other symptoms? The president, uh, we have not yet granted uh, your request. Of course, uh, you are now granted with the last question uh, for the civil party. Your Honor, after my question, uh, Mrs. Bay also has just two questions that she'd like to pose to the accused, if she may. The President, you may proceed to put the questions, otherwise the time, your time will be uh, up. As I say, um, the time for the uh, civil party uh, to put the question to the accused, uh, we will grant that time. Of course, uh, the uh, civil party will have time to put the question to the uh, accused. We understand the importance for the uh, civil party to put the question to the accused. That's why we remind parties, and you in particular, to put the question effectively so that uh, you will make the best use of court time. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Bay, can you quickly describe for us what other symptoms you experienced after you returned from the fall of the Khmer Rouge? As I said earlier, following the Khmer Rouge regime, uh, I have had a uh, psychological uh, impact and of course uh, f physical um, suffering I also sustained it. I got v wounded on my leg and I became very weak. My health was uh, not as good uh, as before and at night I uh, had nightmare. Um, this was uh, the uh, trauma I actually sustained as a consequence of the Khmer Rouge regime. Your Honor, may I ask one further question of the civil party? President, you are not civil party. If you have questions for the accused, you may proceed. Civil Party, Mr. President, I thank you for giving me the opportunity. I do have a questions to be put to the accused. I have three questions, actually. The, the first question is the following. Mr. Kirsten Paul and Mr. Nguyen Chi, you were the leaders leading the country and the regime of the Democratic Campuchia. Were you aware that the Khmer Rouge killed children, even the youngest children, including mine? My second question. Were you aware that the Khmer Rouge soldiers went around mistreating children, interrogating children, and forced children to tell the stories of their parents? And did you order those Khmerus to behave in such a way? And here is my third question. If you were not aware of it, if you did not hear it, or if you did not order for such conduct by the Khmerus, who actually did it? Who actually gave the order? And I would like the response from you as the leaders of the regime at the time. Thank you. President, in principle, 
your questions have to be put through the president and after Mr. Kirsten Pond is present in this courtroom, I will now redirect the questions to Mr. Kirsten Pond first and then Mr. Nunchi Kirsten Pond and you may proceed. Kirsten Pond Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. And good morning, everyone in and around the courtroom. And my national compatriots who are present here today. And good morning, Madame Bay Supani. I would like to respond to your questions. First of all, I would like to inform you that I am not the leader of the Democratic Cambodia regime. Although I was labeled as the head of state, I did not have any authority. And to respond to your question whether I was aware that children were killed by the Khmer Rouge soldiers, and allow me to apologize. I did not know anything at all, and that is the truth. I did not know anything at all regarding this matter. And to respond to your second question, that uh, why children were mistreated and interrogated and were those Khmeru soldiers given instructions to do so? To respond to this uh, second question, I would say I did not know about this matter. Through my knowledge, there was no such order. And to respond to your last question, but before that, allow me to add to your second question. I personally did not give any order through any soldiers to do so. I did not have any authority over the military, not even a smallest group of soldiers. And personally, I am not that cruel and illit illiterate person like that. And for your third question that you asked whether if I did not know who knew about that. You said that you went to Traui Sla. This means that the person who was responsible for that sector was the one who had the authority to do so. This is my understanding. So I myself would oppose such cruel and crazy act. But I really regret that I did not know about this matter, and that is all. Thank you, Mr. President. President, thank you.
the questions by the civil party are now redirected to Nunji. And uh, Nunji, you may respond to the questions. President, Mr. Nunji, can you hear us? If so, can you respond to the questions put to you by the civil party, by Supani? Nunji. Good morning, everyone in and around the courtroom, and good morning, Mr. President, and good morning, Madam. Sotini says noon cheer if I can recall your name correctly. Allow me to express my sorrow and regret for the loss of lives of your family members as mentioned by you this morning. And allow me to contribute to the condolences and to express my condolences to the lost. Allow me to clearly state that the Mrokati Kambuchi did not have any policy to kill its own people. On the contrary, it only had the policies to rescue and to build the people to become a good citizens, to become the, the compatriots and to be loving one another. And as in the case of your children, the Democratic Cambodia regime did not have any policy to kill children, or young children. And allow me to reiterate that point clearly. And please allow me to share the sorrow of the loss of your family members, and that's all, Mr. President. President, thank you. The floor is now given to the prosecution to put the questions to the civil party. You may proceed. You have 10 minutes to do so. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. Good morning to all parties. And good morning to you, Madame Civil Party. We unfortunately have very little time at our disposal, and yet your story is extremely uh, rich in detail and quite lengthy. Therefore, I will ask only a few supplementary questions and do my best to avoid reviving your personal pain and agony. In a letter addressed to Mr. Al Sontuni, you stated that you lost many members uh, from your side of the family, from your husband's side of the family, and that they had uh, departed in order to be executed. I wish to know how you learned of that occurrence, how you learned of those events, and if you know whether or not. Uh, they were identified as members of Mr. Lonno's extended family. I received information from the villagers who were from the native village of my mother-in-law. When the Khmer Rouge chased people away from their houses, my in-law families all went toward uh, their native village that is in Run village in Takao province. So they knew of the backgrounds of my in-law families very well, that my father-in-law was the father-in-law of Marshal Lunol. They knew about the occupation of my elder brother-in-law as well.
Est-ce que plus And were several members, uh, were several of your in-laws members of Lon Nol's army, or did several of your in-laws serve as officials for the Lon Nol regime? My the, the relatives on my husband's side were mainly public servants, and they were senior uh, government officers. For that reason, the burden was placed on the local extended families. Even on my side, uh, my parents who were living in a Kampong Chang were killed because they were the in-law of the Marshal Lonald's father-in-law, and the Khmerus knew about that. Thank you. You've also told this court that many of your husband's friends, who also served as public servants or soldiers for the Lon Nol regime, had perished under the Khmer Rouge regime. Based on your observation, were those public servants uh, specifically sought out and targeted by the Khmer Rouge during the 1975 to 1979 era? I am not sure about the chasings and the killing, but I knew for sure that the Khmer Rouge people killed lunar soldiers, in particular the military officers who were in the rank similar to that of my husband. And there were only a few surviving military officers who are currently living in the United States and a few are living here in Cambodia. I wish to return to the topic of the treatment that was meted out to the April 17 people when they were sent to forced labor. You stated that when villagers were, um, were providing your children some food out of the generosity of their hearts, the Khmer Rouge had prohibited them from doing so. Did the Khmer Rouge ever describe or uh, provide reasons as to why there was different treatment based on different categories of people? And did they ever explain why April 17 people were segregated uh, from the base people? That is true. The Khmerus told me clearly that my social class was different from that of the best people in the village. I was told that I will consider the new people, the 17 April people, while the villagers were considered the best people, and I should be separated from the best people. Excuse And were the base people and 8, 17 April people treated in the same manner, uh, regardless of the village that they lived in, in terms of housing, uh, health care they were given, uh, food they were given, treatment, or uh, even in the manner in which they disappeared? Yes, there was a huge uh, difference. The best people who were considered to live in the liberated zone, they hate more than what we hate. They had sufficient rights to eat. We, the 17 April people, only ate watery gruel with a few grains of uh, rice, and we only had uh, salt to eat. And sometimes we were given very little dry fish or fermented uh, fish but mainly we only ate with salt, and sometimes we were starved, as in my, the case of the death of my son. We were not given sufficient food, and my son died. And what we had at the time was only rice bran and three leaves in the pot. How could we survive with rice bran? The rice bran was meant for pigs to eat. 
but we had to resort to eating rice bran and tree leaves. Dans, dans le même de... In the same document that I referenced to earlier, D22-3850, you stated, Madame Civil Party, on ERN French page 00860741, ERN in English 867208 and in Khmer 0057164. You state the following. I, for one, stayed there in order to uh, break stone, and I was treated as a prisoner of war. The word prisoner of war was used by the Khmer Rouge regarding the 17 April people. Why is this so, madame? We were treated as uh, the new people, the 17 April, 17 April people, which had a different social status a class compared to the best people. While we were working, we were watched by armed people. Even during the night time, when we were sleeping, people would be walking around and monitoring us. We were forced to break rock and to achieve the three Tau of a rocks per day for road construction. I was wounded in my leg and I was forced to break a big rock. And at the time, Mr. President and Your Honours, I did not have any medicine for the treatment of my leg. The wound became worse and infected and I could not walk but I had to move my myself to go and break rock otherwise my ratio would be withdrawn so I had to work while I was sick and the only thing that I could use for the treatment of my wound was to pick the tobacco remains that was thrown away by the Khmer Rouge and I use it uh, for the treatment of my wound. Merci. Thank you. Unfortunately, I do not have enough time to delve further into that matter. However, I do have two remaining uh, questions or subjects that you were raised in the same document concerning a woman who was severely beaten and punished by the Khmer Rouge because one of her children had denounced that she stole a pumpkin and you stated that the woman was the uh, wife of the uh, unit chief and it was explained that she was not beaten as an individual but it was uh, she was being beaten on behalf of the regime on behalf of encore as a way of retaliating against uh, imperialists and capitalists. Were you able to sense uh, the sense of mistrust and defiance that the leaders felt against uh, people such as yourself, uh, members of the bourgeois class? That is true. A woman whose husband was a former soldier and who was breaking rock uh, next to me was that while the mother was breaking rock, the children who were left behind in the village were beaten up and interrogated. They were asked whether of what the parents uh, were doing during the former regime and whether they stole anything from Onka. When I returned from uh, breaking rock, I saw at the back of my children, they actually used a 
charcoal chalk uh, to draw or write something on the backs of my children and I noticed they did that almost every day because when I returned from work my children waved and they told me that they were bitten and asked about uh, the occupation of the father and the mother and whether I stole anything and I told my two children whatever they were asked don't ever say that your father was a military officer and lived in the United States and you have to remember that otherwise if you tell them then you will be killed and so would I I would be killed as well so although my children were beaten up by the Khmer rules every day as they were asked about my husband and I, my children maintained that they did not know anything. And I told them that they should say that my husband was a teacher and that we were separated. And that's all they should reply to the Khmer rules. And they remembered the phrase and they always replied the same thing. And for that reason, I survived here today. But for that woman who was breaking rock nearby me, the children of the woman were asked and they were scared and then they told the Khmeru soldiers that uh, one day my mother hit a pumpkin. So the Khmeru soldier went around looking for a, a pumpkin and they couldn't find it so they used a piece of wood each and began beating that woman. They tied her hands to the back and asked her to stand on her knees. They were, she was beaten up and she protested that she did not steal anything. But they kept beating and beating and they even kicked her in the chest. The the woman, the Khmer Rouge female who was uh, pregnant also kicked her chest and scolded her that uh, she was an imperialist and she was a capitalist and they kept beating her. So the mother was beaten up in front of me at the rock quarry and we, the ones who were breaking rock at the time, were told by the Khmer Rouge that the woman was beaten up because she was the enemy and she stole stuff and eat. We could not do anything. We kept our head down. And we were encouraged to beat that woman. Even if I had to die, I would not lay my hand on her. This is the kind of mistreatment conducted by the Khmer Rouge toward the 17th April people. Merci. Uh, thank you. And one final question as follows. Concerning the treatment uh, awaiting the April 17 people, by the end of the war and just prior to the the Vietnamese invasion. What were the village chiefs saying or doing to the 17 April people? President, prosecutor, could you repeat your question as there seems to have no interpretation in the other two languages? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Yes, certainly, Mr. President. Uh, concerning the fate that awaited the 17 April people, a significant event that you raised in your written statement is that as the Vietnamese troops were arriving at the end of 1978, what were the village chiefs asking of uh, the April 17 people. Apparently, they were ordered to dig uh, something. Can you please further elaborate? 
Chat to me. Toward the end of the regime, upon the imminent arrival of the Vietnamese troops, Khmer Rouge soldiers forced us the 17 April people as that was the uh, stage that the 17 April people were placed in a separate village and that village was named the 17 April village. We were forced to dig a pit each, which was two meter wide and the width was dependent on the number of the uh, family members. I asked the Khmer Rouge why I was asked to dig a pit, and I was told that it was meant for fertilizer. And I told the Khmer Rouge that I did not have any uh, fertilizer to put in the pit, and I was by myself, and I was sent to the front by the Khmer Rouge. But they kept asking me to dig to dig a pit, it was 2 meter by 0 0.5 meter and 1 meter deep, but I did not complete it yet because the Vietnamese troops arrived. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Madame Civil Party, for having answered my questions. I have no further questions to put to you. Thank you, Mr. President. President, the floor is now given to Nunji's team to put questions to this civil party. You may proceed. Do you have any issue to raise? Says the President. Your Honor, as Mrs. Bay has flown all the way from the United States and she has very valuable information on the impact of her suffering, we ask for just five more minutes for the civil parties to pose the questions on suffering to her. The president, uh, you are grant, uh, you are granted with the um, time to put the question uh, to the civil party. You have five minutes. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Mrs. Bay, I just have three more questions for you. What you described to us that you have symptoms such as nightmares. Did any of these symptoms change when you left Cambodia and came to the United States? This symptom has stayed with me until today. And I am, even though I arrived in the United States, but the traumatic experience uh, still uh, follow me. Because when I got to the United States, I look at the children of American family. I recall the time when I had with my family why my children were so unfortunate 
American family and children had access to education. They live a happy life in the family. But my family's life was a complete different. I still recall uh, the time when my uh, children talked to me. I remember every word they said uh, to me. Whenever I recall that moment, I felt traumatic. I could not hold my tear. I my tears runs down immediately whenever I recall the past sorrowful experience in our family, particularly the tragic death of my children during the Khmer Rouge period. And did you have any more children at the end of the war? I do not have, I do not have any any children following the uh, collapse of the regime, and as I said, my health got deteriorated during the Khmer Rouge regime. Uh, I, as a woman, I did not have any homorage, and I was living like a man. I did not have my Sexual health did not allow me to have any other children. Now, Mrs. Bay, we're aware that you're a mental health counselor at the Gardner Health Center and that you work with Cambodian victims of the Khmer Rouge regime. Can you tell us what problems you see amongst these victims that are living in the U.S. today? It is true. In the present job I am holding, I provide mental counseling uh, to the people, particularly refugee, Cambodian refugee in particular, under the Cambodian program. The Cambodian refugee who have brought along with them the traumatic life that they had come across during the Khmer Rouge regime. Each and every family of the Cambodian refugee had uh, suffered uh, traumatic experience uh, during uh, that period. No family was spared from the uh, atrocity. That's why I have been working to assist a Cambodian family uh, by providing mental counseling, particularly to Cambodian families who uh, do not make a good living in the United States. Uh, we uh, provide them counseling not only to uh, reconcile them uh, uh, for the uh, traumatic experience they have come across, but also the uh, life pressure that they have uh, had uh, when they resided in the United States. Uh, those uh, Cambodian American family uh, described to me their suffering uh, during the regime as well as the pressures that they have, particularly those who are at the elderly uh, stage in life. Uh, they had come across the Khmer Rouge regime. They uh, suffering as I uh, have had. Uh, they told me about nightmare uh, that they had. I believe them completely because I myself experienced that. I still have nightmare until today. Uh, I have never had any good uh, dream. I have never had dream of uh, a glorious life in the United States. I have never dream of resettling in the United States. I only dream of the Khmer Rouge chasing after me uh, for my life. And this suffering you described, how has it affected uh, their lives in the United States, their ability to adapt to life in the United States? For, are you talking about Cambodian American families or myself? Both of you.
they have suffered mental um, suffering as uh, everyone might be well aware that the Khmer Rouge regime uh, took place in some 30 years ago. However, the mental um, state of mind of Cambodian people uh, who came across this regime, both uh, the average Cambodian uh, family and myself, we still have this mental uh, 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 suffering. Thank you, Mrs. Bay. And as a victim living in the United States, can you tell us quickly, why did you apply uh, to be a civil party in case two? The suffering I have had uh, cannot be uh, compensated. My uh, tears continue to drop. I would like to appeal to the court to find justice, to find justice for my dead children, to my family uh, who were killed by the Khmer Rouge. None of my family members survive uh, the regime. If uh, those uh, dead family member do not find justice. I believe that I will not be able to die at peace as a mother, as a daughter uh, for my, of my parents and a mother of my children. I want to find justice uh, for them. And not until the justice is done for them, I am not feeling appeased. I would like to ask the court to find justice uh, for the victims. I have been waiting for a long time for the justice to be brought uh, to us. And I want to see justice. And I want to see today. And today is what I have been waiting for. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bay. And thank you, Your Honors. I have no further questions. And the floor is given to Nguyen Chi's defense to put questions to this civil party. You may take the floor. Sonarun. Good morning, Your Honours, Mr. President, and good morning once again, Bay Supani. My name is Sonarun, a defense counsel for Noon Chi. I have some questions for you this morning. You, through the limited time that I have, I shall be brief. On the 17th April 1975, where were you? Answer. On the 17th April 1975, I was in Phnom Penh near the area of Chimka Mon. Thank you. Question. On that day, that is the 17th April 1975, the Khmer Rouge soldiers came to your house. What time was it? Answer. On the 17th April 1975, the Khmer soldiers did not enter my house, but they were shooting into the air and chasing the people, that is, uh, my neighbors, to immediately leave their houses. They fired shots into the air and chased us to go away in three days because the Americans would drop bombs. I was shocked upon hearing that, so I could no longer stay in my house. In addition, I could not stay long and waiting for the Khmer Rouge to enter my house and saw the photos of my husband who was the senior military officer in military uniform as well as the photos of my extended families of Marshal Lunol. Thank you. Question. 
The Khmerus did not directly chase you to go away from your house, but it did so to your neighbors. Is that correct? Answer. They were about to come to my house because they were approaching from my neighboring houses and it would come to my house soon. For that reason, I decided to leave my house immediately. That was the case that they chased everybody to leave the house. Question. As you said, they did not chase you, you and your family, but they did so to your neighbors. But it was your understanding that it was unavoidable that uh, they would chase you from your house. Is this correct? Answer. The Khmer Rouge chased people from every house, and they were about to come to my house. For that reason, I hate to leave my house because I was very sure that they would come to my house soon. Question. Allow me to clarify this point. When they were about to approach uh, you and your house, how far were they and how many houses were in between? President, Madam Civil Party, please pause a bit until you see the red light on the microphone. Answer. It was just one house down, then it would be my house. For that reason, I was very shocked. I did not gather much belonging and I had to leave with my children. Thank you. Question. Does this mean you left Phnom Penh on your own free will and not by the Khmer rules? Is this correct? Answer. I did not leave my house on my own free will. Who would do that? It's because of the act by the Khmer Rouge soldiers. They fire shots into the air and they chase people to go away from their house. As instead, the Americans would drop bomb, And that was the statement that scared everyone. So although they did not come to my house yet, and of course I would be afraid for them to come to my house and see the photos of my husband and families. I hate to leave. If they were to enter my house and saw the photos and while I was there, then there would be big trouble for me. Question. Yes, I understand your point. Allow me to move forward. When the Khmerus were one house down from your house, did you observe that they were threatening at your neighbors or they were in an ordinary, normal character or behavior? President, Civil Party, please wait the assigned Council for Civil Party. You may uh, proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. This line of questioning is repetitive, and at this point, I believe the Defense Council is badgering our witness. Sonarun, allow me to respond. I am a defense counsel, and we haven't yet questioned or completed the questions of this civil party. And that is the right of the defense counsel to only focus on one particular matter or to put it in a segmented 
based on our approach and if of course the civil party cannot respond that would be at the discretion of the bench President, the objection raised by the assigned counsel for civil party is not sustained. The civil party, you are instructed to respond to the question put to you by the defense counsel. President, it seems that the civil party cannot recall the last question put to her. Defense counsel, please repeat your last question. Council. In order to save time, as we only have 10 minutes, I move on. When you saw the Khmer Rouge approaching your house, what did you observe? Were they, in, were they behaving in a cruel manner or was their behavior uh, normal? And what were they wearing? At that time, what was the environment uh, like? Answer. They were of stern facial expressions. They stared at us. They threatened everyone to leave the house. They fired shots into the air and they shouted for everyone to leave the house. Otherwise, the Americans would drop the bombs. And that we had to leave the house within, uh, for three days. So they were not in a humble banner, they were of a cruel nature. And they wore black uniform. Counsel, thank you. You were not chased from your house, but from your response, it's, it looks very clear that they did so to you and that you saw them threatening and they firing shot into the air. When they were near your house, did you hear them uh, shouting directly? And how come you seem to be very sure on your response? Answer. I was very sure because the house was not far from my house. I heard everything. I heard the loud uh, shouting by the Khmer Rouge chasing people to go away from their house. It was not the gentle voice. And of course, this is compounded uh, by the fact that they fire shots into the air. And that is the fact. Counsel, thank you. When you evacuated yourself from Phnom Paint, you reach a certain location and you ran out of rice and food and everything else. And you only had a ring which was a gift from your in-law. So you changed it for rice and later on you changed it for medicine, if I am not mistaken. My question is, when you did the battering, that is from uh, rice uh, to medicine, whom did you exchange it with and where? President, civil party, please pause. The assigned counsel for civil party, you may proceed. Your Honor, the defense counsel just assumed a fact that was not given in her testimony. He just claimed that Mrs. Bay evacuated herself when she has clearly repeated over and over again that she heard orders telling people to leave the city and there were gunshots. She did not evacuate herself, nor has she ever made this statement. So we would appreciate it if you didn't pose this in a question to her when she has not made that testimony. Son Aaron, 
the objection raised uh, by the assigned counsel is not to the point that I said. This is a, a new fact. She said she had a, a diamond earring, which was a gift from the, her in-law, and in a row of exchanges, uh, she got the medicine. And my question is, whom did she exchange it with and where? That is my main point of the question. President, Assigned Council for Civil Parties, you may proceed. And Madam Civil Party, please wait. Your Honor, I'm objecting to the form of the question. He began the question by assuming a fact that wasn't in Mrs. Bay's testimony. He said, when you evacuated yourself, um, and then he proceeded with the remainder of his question. We're objecting to that form of question that he posed to her. President, the objection is not sustained. Civil Party, you are instructed to respond to the last question put to you by the Defense Council. Civil Party, I exchanged my ring and it was done secretly with the villagers in that village. That was the Trauisla village. Question, were those villagers uh, the new 17 April people or were they the best people in the village? President, Madam Civil Party, please observe a slight pause before you respond. Civil Party. Those were the villagers who had been living in that uh, Trausla village. They had pity on me and they gave us food. And I exchanged the ring with them secretly with, without the knowledge of the Khmer Rouge. Council, my point is what kind of people did you exchange the ring with? Were they the best people or were they the new people like yourself? Answer, they were not the new people, they were the, the old people or the best people as they were called at the time. Question, if they were the best people, how did they know that uh, your ring was of a great value and agreed to exchange it for rice? Answer. They knew it very well. Because they were not the people who never knew the city. They were of a kind of a wealthy status who lived in the village. They knew the gold and the diamond very well. Question. This morning, you stated before this court that before the arrival of the Vietnamese, you were asked to dig a pit, which was uh, through time 0 0.5 with a 1 meter depth. Why were you asked to dig the pit? Were you given any reasons for digging the pit? Answer. 
you were mistaken. It's not the Vietnamese who asked me to dig the pit. It was the the Khmer Rouge. It was the the dep the chief and the deputy chief of the village who forced the people to dig pits for each family. Council, I apologize if I uh, made a mistake in my question. But in fact, my question was prior to the arrival of the Vietnamese, the Khmer Rouge at the time asked you and the, the family to dig the pit. Were you given reasons for digging the pit? Answer. I did not have any family members remain with me. I was by myself as my children all died. I was living in the 17 April village at the time. And the persons who asked me to dig the pit were the chief and the deputy chief of the village. And each family was asked to dig a pit. And as I was by myself, I was also asked to dig a pit. And I asked why. And the Khmer Rouge soldiers told me that although I was by myself, I was considered a family on my own. And I was asked to dig the pit, which was to meter long, half a meter wide, and one meter deep, but I did not complete the digging because the Vietnam is right. Counsel, this is my last question. You told the court this morning that your health is not uh, that great, and your memory doesn't serve you well, and you have a chronic mental trauma. If you have all these symptoms and conditions, how could you work in an organization to assist other women in mental health? President, the assigned counsel for civil parties, you may proceed. Your Honor, Mrs. Bain never said in her testimony that her memory was not good. Um, we would really ask that the defense counsel stop assuming facts that aren't in the evidence when he's posing his questions to Mrs. Bay. Defense counsel. As a defense counsel, I am entitled to ask even a smaller detail from the civil party in order to make sure the statement she makes is truthful or not. That is my point. President, Council, it seems that you don't really follow the proceedings and the procedures practiced in this court. You can only object once through the same point, not twice. And your objection is sustained. The question that put by the defense counsel is not related to the facts being processed before this court. For that reason, civil, counts, civil party, you are instructed not to respond to the last question. And the time is now apt for the Nunchi's defense. And the floor is therefore given to Kills and Pons' defense. Defense counsel. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors. And good morning, Madam Civil Party. On behalf of uh, my client, Kills and Pons, I do not have any questions for this civil party. President, thank you. And thank you, Madam Bay Supani. The hearing of your statement of sufferings and harm and testimony has now concluded. You may be excused from this court. And your statement of suffering and harm and testimony may contribute to ascertaining the truth in this case and 
We wish you good health and good luck, and you may return to your residence. Court officer, in collaboration with the Visu, please assist Madame Bay Supani for her return to her residence or wherever she wishes to go to. You may now leave the courtroom, Madame Bay Supani.